Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning from Frankfurt. Today we have guests from over 10 countries and regions and as Frankfurt is one hour ahead of London, we very much appreciate your early participation today. Welcome to the 32nd Financial Center Breakfast, which is organized and arranged by Frankfurt Mind Finance in cooperation with the Association of Foreign Banks in Germany. I'm Andreas Prechtel, Managing Director of the Foreign Banks Association, and I'm very grateful for all the hard work of Hubertus Feit, who is joining us today, Andreas Glenzel, who is uh, joining in the background, and their colleagues from Frankfurt Mind Finance to arrange this Financial Center Breakfast. What can be better than to begin a successful day with a foot for thought on a topic which is of huge, huge importance, not only for the players in Europe's financial industry, but for financing the recovery of Europe after the pandemic and the role which Europe will play in the worldwide competition of financial centers. The costs of overcoming the negative effects of the pandemic are enormous and the EU financial and capital markets and its players are key to financing a successful building back better which is currently prepared on EU and on country levels. Deepening the EU Capital Markets Union and Banking Union is a must in order to raise and correctly allocate financing resources, in order to raise and, uh, resources to enable uh, impacted industries of all kinds to strive again and possibly even strengthen their competitive role in the markets by being able to issue uh, equity and debt. At the same time, European financial centers are fighting hard after Brexit to each gain a maximum piece of the business cake and to position themselves within Europe. In addition, the EU is playing a decisive role in creating a fair playground here. But there is also a global perspective on, the, on this, as we also see European business being shifted to Asia and to the US, so we live in a global market. Therefore, we are very delighted and honored to have Dr. Adam Farkas, Chief Executive Officer of AFMI, the Association of Financial Markets in Europe, speaking to us today on the topic of EU capital markets, scale, competitiveness, and liquidity for supporting growth. Many of you know AFMI as one of the best connected and most influential associations advocating for stable, competitive, sustainable capital markets. Most of the leading global and European banks and other significant capital market players are members of AFMI, and rely on its deep technical expertise and its strong and long-standing relationships to policymakers on EU level, but also uh, in European countries. I'm delighted that we as Association of Foreign Banks in Germany, which is focused on advising members on how regulation and supervision is actually working uh, and implemented here in Germany, have a close relationship with Adam and his colleagues from AFNA, of course driven by many common members and by our common interests in developing and implementing regulation to deepen and developing the capital markets. Adam Farkas is the Chief Executive Officer of AFMA since February 2020 only and already has built a great career. Uh, before joining AFMA, he was the Executive Director of the European Banking Authority, EBA, from April 2011 until the end of uh, January 2020. And prior to joining the EBA, he acted as the Executive Chairman of the Hungarian Financial Supervisory Authority between 2009 and 2010. He was CEO for Allianz Bank from 2006 and 2009 and co-CEO of CIB Bank between 2002 and 2005. So really has a, a pedigree in, um, in banking. Between 1997 and 2001, he was managing director and member of the board of the National Bank of Hungary. Adam started his career as an assistant professor at the Budapest University of Economic Sciences and was a consultant to various financial institutions in Budapest and London. And he holds a doctorate in finance and a master's in computer-based simulation and modeling from Sunderland University. And I find this bit especially interesting. So probably that's his, uh, the, the reason for his favor for numbers. Um, the audience, um, please feel free to input your questions during or after Adam's speech uh, in the Q&A section in, in Zoom, um, you may be familiar with. There is a, a little button there where you can input your, your questions. And um, a recording of the speech will be posted on Frankfurt Mind Finance website tomorrow. Um, other than that, I think, Adam, we are set. The stage is yours.
mute Adam. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andreas, uh, for the kind uh, introduction. I'm I'm very pleased and honored to be uh, to be invited again uh, to speak to uh, to speak to you. Um, I would have liked to to do it in person, but we are still confined to our uh, to our homes and and and, and offices. Uh, but I hope that uh, next time when there is an opportunity uh, to, to meet, I will be with you um, in, in, in Frankfurt. As you, um, as you alluded to today, I would like to talk about a subject which is very um, close to the heart of AFMI and AFMI members, uh, which is the development of EU capital markets, how, these capit how, how capital markets in, in the EU, in Europe, can scale up, become very competitive, more liquid, and, and, and at the end, uh, support the growth of the European economy. And on, under this subject, I would like to talk about, or I would like to answer four main questions. Um, one, the first one would be, what is the scale of the funding challenge for EU corporates um, after the, uh, the we, we, are, we are leaving the, uh, the pandemic economic shock? The second question is, what sources of equity financing um, are available? Uh, the Third one is, what are the key issues for the different types of corporates to access this funding? And the, the last one is, you alluded to um, already, is the regulatory environment. How can the upcoming reviews of EU markets regulation help in furthering the development of capital markets in Europe? So let me turn to the first question. What is the scale of the funding challenge? We all know that the COVID-19 pandemic has prompted an unprecedented scale of public support to help businesses and their employees through the crisis. However, while these measures have been crucial in ensuring business survival in the short term, they do not address the upcoming need to repair the equity base of many EU27 corporates, which has been severely eroded by COVID-19. We need to move beyond bridge finance in the form of debt to instead focus on long-term economic repair and recovery. That has largely provided the rescue, but equity recapitalization is needed to accelerate the recovery. By alleviating the constraints of regular debt and interest payments, equity finance can accelerate growth by enabling companies to invest for the long-term. Public equity markets have supported existing listed companies reasonably well today, and I will come back to that later. However, private markets lack the depth to support many other corporates in need of recapitalization. Solutions are needed for unlisted mid-caps and SMEs, which make up the vast majority of EU corporates. AFMI and PwC published a report back in January um, of this year um, under the title Recapitalizing, Recapitalizing EU Businesses Post-COVID-19, where this report estimated that the total losses and damage to the equity of EU corporates is around a trillion euros across 2020 and 2021. This brings me to the second question. Uh, what sources of equity financing are available to meet this need? Um, and, and, and again, the estimate of this need is, uh, is a rough estimate, but it, 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 it shows that there is a, there is a massive funding need uh, emerging uh, post-COVID in, in Europe. It is also difficult to estimate uh, the, uh, the equity sources um, of funding available in the EU and the mechanism by which the EU-wide public funds will be deployed via grants that equity guarantees have not been fully determined. In terms of private, we looked at um, private sector sources of traditional or common equity funding, and we uh, found that in 2020, uh, 77.4 billion euros of equity was raised in the public markets by listed EU27 non-financial corporates. However, if we look at um, this number uh, compared to the overall need, it only represents about 7.7% .7 of, the, of the 1 trillion of equity funding needs expected. We found, uh, we looked at it and found that there is additional dry powder, uninvested commitments available from private equity uh, funds, pr the private equity sector, and it is estimated to be about 270 billion that is out there in European private equity and it's available uh, to be invested. In terms of public sector funding at, at the EU level, the main potential sources include the European Investment Bank's 25 billion uh, pan, uh, pan European Guarantee Fund, uh, the EGF, uh, 
uh, which was created exactly uh, for the purpose of providing an immediate response to the COVID-19 crisis. If it's fully leveraged, uh, it can mean to generate up to 200 billion in fresh financing targeted at mid-caps and SMEs, of which some is likely to be debt, quasi-equity or guarantees. Uh, parts of the European Commission's 750 billion next generation EU recovery fund uh, can also be channeled partially to, uh, uh, to, to equity investments. These EU level public sector resources are also expected to feed into, uh, into or combine with the equity available from existing member state development and promotional banks, such as the KFW in Germany or BPI in France and similar programs elsewhere. In total, AFME and P, uh, the, the AFME and PwC report estimates that public and private sector equity available at the EU level will range between 400 to 550 billion, depending on, on how conservative or optimistic the assumptions are. But with this, with this estimate, uh, what we found um, again in, in, in this report that there will be uh, an, an additional need uh, to replace um, equity um, of, 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 the, of the total uh, 1 trillion in the range of, of um, 450 to 600 billion in public and private sector equity uh, funding. This is significant. Uh, this additional funding will need to be, uh, will need to be met uh, from various sources in the coming years to properly recapitalize and re-equitize uh, European corporates in order to allow them to fund their future growth uh, as well as to, uh, to rebalance their, um, their funding structure, to uh, rebalance their, uh, their balance sheet structure on the liability side. This, um, th this, this uh, brings me to the third question. How, what are the key issues for corporates, uh, the non-financial sector, uh, that, uh, that need to be uh, addressed and how we can help uh, by developing capital markets in, the, in this process? First of all, let's look at large corporates. Large corporates have generally been able to access debt and equity finance to manage through the crisis, uh, with the exception of a few very select sectors uh, that were severely hit um, by, by COVID, such as the uh, aviation industry, which needed public support. But other than these specific sectors, large corporates actually managed to rely on private uh, sources of funding and they managed to uh, have very good access throughout the crisis and, and, and they have this access uh, today. The report find, finds that mid-caps and SMEs um, would first look to cut costs and restructure before seeking recapitalization. That, 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 that is based on a number of interviews with, uh, with, with, uh, with companies in, in this sector. The findings also reveal that many mid-size and SME corporates do not wish to give up control of their business, but they are willing to pay a premium not to dilute their voting rights. So uh, these are the companies which are closely held, potentially family controlled or controlled by a few shareholders, and they clearly have a preference to maintain this control. And to maintain this control, they are also willing uh, to pay some premium to external investors who are accepting not to have um, uh, control. They are also willing to distribute a share of profits to investors, assuming that they maintain uh, control. So the report, in the report, what we found that hybrid instruments um, are likely to be well suited um, to address these needs, uh, which would allow uh, companies and shareholders of these companies to maintain the controls, on the other hand, allow long-term equity type capital uh, to enter the balance sheet and, and help their, uh, their funding needs. The report concludes that there is an opportunity for policymakers to work together on solutions which, with the private sector and the national, at the national and EU levels to address the needs for corporate recapitalization with several viable options to be developed in parallel. One is that the EU could explore the development of a new EU-wide hybrid instrument designed specifically for non-financial corporates and SMEs. This could also be in the form of a new preferred share instrument, which is state aid compliant uh, to build scale and liquidity in which ideally could be, this, this could ideally be developed to comply with ESG investment objectives to attract maximum investor interest. 
another, uh, another development could be replicating existing member state best practices on hybrid instruments and raising awareness of the large uh, of the range of capital markets instruments available to mid caps and SMEs across the EU. The third option or the third possibility um, would be exploring further use of innovative instruments such as dual class shares to address the control concerns of companies and the debt for equity swaps to reduce leverage. Um, and another, another proposal which we had in the, in, in the report was to, to possibly to look at the state aid rules uh, for systemic crisis situations to, uh, to allow uh, these, these re-equitization programs to move um, uh, at speed and with, with high level of effectiveness. And um, of course, the last point is accelerating equity instrument measures under the CMU project. Uh, we, feel, we feel that the, uh, the CMU project um, is, um, is, is um, uh, receiving a lot of attention due to the, uh, to the needs that are emerging uh, post COVID-19. I, I noted that large corporates have generally been able to access debt and equity finance to manage through the crisis. One of the reasons um, for this is that they are already uh, have access to listed markets. And these markets have functioned remarkably well uh, during this period. Uh, we also issued a report which, uh, which showed data that markets in Europe, uh, in the UK, and, and actually in the, in the US as well, uh, sustained um, a, a remarkable resilience throughout the crisis and functioned um, um, very well. And this is especially true for, uh, for equity markets. There are many reasons for this, but I would like to argue that there are two aspects of the market structure in particular which have helped. First um, is that in equity markets, investors have a choice of trading modalities or trading mechanisms. Most trading takes place on regulated markets or multilateral trading facilities. Some trading also takes place over the counter and through systemic internalizers. When there is not always an immediately available match between a buyer and seller, banks acting as systemic internalizers can step, up, step in using their balance sheets to provide this match. This is helpful for savers and pensioners, particularly when they are represented by institutional investors, as this helps avoid negative market impacts that buying or selling large volumes might otherwise create. This combination of trading modalities provides for a diverse trading landscape, which provides choice to investors and promotes competition, thereby lowering their costs of trading and maximizing their potential returns. And at the moment, there is a need uh, th there is indeed some choice for investors, and it is important at this very challenging time that we do not do anything which might jeopardize this. I will come back to this point a little bit later. In addition to having a diverse trading landscape, it is very important for investors and issuers that the secondary equity markets are liquid. This is the second feature which I think has helped support large corporates access equity markets over the past year. Second. Secondary market liquidity is not only a benefit for participants in this market itself, it is also a benefit for companies that wish to raise new equity in the primary market. The reason for this is quite simple. Investors might hesitate to provide finance on the primary market if they are not confident that they can realize their investment at a later date. Alternatively, they may, may still be keen to invest but they may require a higher rate of return to compensate for the greater risk of not being able to realize their investment. In such, in such a case, it may be that the higher rate of return is then too high for the issuing company. And so the result may be that the equity issuance does not take place at all. Put it in another way, if the market is liquid, then all, if all other things being equal, the cost of finance will be lower and therefore more attractive for the issuer. It has been observed by many that the scale of the EU's capital market remained underdeveloped compared to those of its peers and in relation to the size of its economy. There are many contributing factors and some strong initiatives within the Commission's CMU action plan uh, to help with this. What I want to emphasize is that building strong and competitive secondary markets goes hand in hand with the aim of having well-developed primary markets and thus can also promote IPOs and contribute to the necessary re-equitization of the European economy. This brings me to the final question what I would like to address today. How can the upcoming reviews of EU markets regulations support competitive markets? 
to grow the capacity of the EU's capital markets, any regulatory changes should aim at improving investor experience so as to encourage their participation in EU markets. Again, this is particularly necessary to address the scale of the equity shortfall in EU, EU corporates face. It is also important to ensure that growth firms choose to list on EU markets rather than elsewhere. We all know um, a number of examples where promising, growing, excellent EU firms have eventually chosen uh, to list their shares somewhere else outside of Europe, uh, thereby reducing uh, the, the size of, of, of capital markets turning to other sources of funding outside of Europe. So it, it is a key objective that, that Europe can retain these companies and the, the, their choice of listing is, uh, is, it, is within, uh, within Europe. One key part, one of the key parts of the existing EU capital market regulatory framework, which contribute to ensuring the best outcomes for investors, is the market, market in financial instruments directive and regulation, MIFID and MIFIR. The Commission is due to issue proposals for reviewing MIFIR in, in, the, in the last quarter of this year, and it will be fundamental to promoting diverse and well-regulated EU capital markets which support the needs of investors and consumers. In AFMI's view, there are two principles which should guide the upcoming review. The first, it should focus on outcomes for investors and corporates. The review should, should be aimed at improving the state of play for users of capital markets. It should not focus on banks or exchanges, but, but rather on savers, pensioners and issuing, issuing corporates to maximize their returns and reduce their financing costs respectively. EU investors and end users are the ultimate beneficiaries of capital markets and pursuing best execution on behalf of end investors is a key investor protection principle that should be preserved. Secondly, it should be evidence-based. The review must be anchored on a, on a thorough impact assessment of the benefits and costs of any proposed changes. This may sound like an obvious point, but a thorough impact assessment is not an easy task because there is a huge amount of very complex data to analyze. A case in point is the analysis of equity market structure. The existing equity market structure rules in MIFIR are a relatively complex set of interconnected rules which act together in a very carefully calibrated balance. This makes the impact assessment very important indeed. However, trade reporting data such as the pub that, that is published by ESMA in its EU um, Securities Market Statistical Report in, in 2020, for example, is very rough, very raw, and in its present state does not accurately describe the EU equities trading landscape. It is insufficiently granular to identify trading modalities or mechanisms under MIFID. The regulatory reporting system in the EU suffers from inaccuracies as trade data passes through multiple national entities and it's only received by ESMA on an aggregated basis. These challenges have led to a very lively debate on precisely how to categorize the trade reporting data and how to interpret it. As I said, a key underlying principle is that that the MIFIR review should be based on a thorough impact assessment. We are doing some detailed analysis of EU trading data uh, as, as I speak um, at AFMI with the help of, uh, of a consultant. And we think that from the point of view of the investor, it is important to identify the trades which contribute to price formation and which trades do not, and to understand where those, uh, those respective types of trades are taking place to make sure that there is sufficient competition. We are still working through it, but the work so far seems to broadly confirm what I mentioned earlier, that most, of our, most around 80% of trading is on exchanges and multilateral trading facilities, and with about 20% over the counter or through systemic internalizers. We hope that our, our analysis, which we will publish shortly, will be a useful source of evidence to support the impact assessment which the Commission will need to carry out. And that it will also help to avoid future regulatory changes which might inadvertently reduce competition in this market. We, public, we plan to publish the analysis shortly so that it's fully available to the Commission and to other stakeholders. Uh, there are several other important areas in the upcoming review which will contribute to a well-functioning market. I would like to highlight three of them, um, data transparency, the cost of market data and investor protection. I'm encouraged that the EU Commission intends to take forward the establishment of a post-trade consolidated tape for equity and bond instruments. While there are challenges to address, 
this has the potential to democratize access to European markets by providing all investors with a comprehensive and standardized view of the European trading environment. Connected, however, is the cost of market data, which is an issue that must be addressed as the success of a consolidated tape will be closely connected to the price at which the provider of this information obtains the input from the venues. I will add that the Commission is rightly uh, put retail investors in, at the heart of the CMU. Direct retail investor participation should be carefully nurtured and indirect participation of pensioners and savers uh, should not be less favorably treated. AFMI supports establishing a more proportionate investor protection regime for the benefit of the end investor, including a better differentiation between professional and retail clients in key areas. This will only add to the attractiveness of engaging in capital markets for not just Europe's citizens and businesses, but those beyond our borders. And finally, I would like to come back to the point that Europe capital, Europe's capital markets are underdeveloped. Maximizing efficiencies in the EU's internal capital markets by harmonizing standards and removing barriers between EU member states, while vitally important, will only go so far in increasing their capacity. I believe we all recognize that markets are globally interconnected and that this is critical for attracting global capital and investors to the EU. It is therefore important uh, we keep this external dimension in mind as we work to develop our own markets. I would like to come to a close by summarizing. What is the scale of, fun of the funding challenge for EU corporates? About 1 trillion uh, of equity, according to the estimates um, we, we published earlier today. What sources of equity financing are available? Many sources, but there is a significant gap as we, as we found. What are the key issues for different types of corporates? For mid-sized corporates and SMEs, it is about exploring cost-effective ways of securing equity or hybrid finance. For larger corporates, it's about ensuring that listed markets are competitive and liquid. And how, an upcoming review, how the upcoming reviews of EU markets regulation can help by ensuring that they are based on a very thorough and rigorous analysis of the data and by ensuring that Europe remains open and connected to the global investor base. I would like to thank you for your attention and would be happy to answer any questions um, uh, on, on, on this topic. Thank you very much, Adam. A very comprehensive overview um, and, uh, and, and very important data you've shared with us today. Thank you. Thank you for that. The first question which we come in is, um, is it needed that the EU thinks in a more general term in making equity investments more attractive? Um, you've, you've rightly highlighted that there is obviously, in Germany, we call it uh, too little equity culture. We, we have uh, we spent decades in, uh, in, in, in getting more in investors into equities, which, by the way, during the pandemic, we've seen a, we've seen a significant rise uh, at it and uh, hope we'll keep it. Um, but, um, but is there a need for making equity investments more generally attractive in Europe? Yes, um, uh, the, 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 answer, the answer is clearly yes. I think there is a broader cultural issue in Europe, across, uh, across Europe, um, which would need to address um, starting from education, uh, starting from, uh, from, from, from the basic understanding of equity investments uh, by, by, uh, by investors, by, by the citizens, all the way to establishing, and, and I mentioned, I made reference to, uh, to a number of these aspects, all the way to uh, establishing the conditions in which uh, equity investments can be an attractive opportunity. And this can include tax, this can include pension system, this can include measures to uh, allow um, safely uh, the, 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 the wide retail participation of, um, of, of Europe's citizens and savers in the, in the equities markets. So, uh, so the short answer to your question, yes, there is a need for a much broader um, effort in addition to, uh, in addition to um, uh, addressing specific uh, points of the institutional framework or the um, or the or, or, yeah. or the market will, structure. Will, will AFM play a role in that discussion as well? Yes, uh, certainly. We are we are we are clearly this is this is as, as I mentioned this is uh, clearly something which is a, which is um, very very high priority for AFMI. 
um, and, 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 and our firms. And we are very happy to, and, and, and we are very active in, um, in making these arguments, um, publishing reports. We are really trying to reach a wide audience uh, with these reports. Some of these reports, of course, can be very technical, uh, but the key messages um, uh, can be well communicated and understood. And, and we are very passionate to, to help uh, in this. Um, of course, we are not we are not an uh, we are not an educational institution. We are not 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 uh, involved in 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 uh, directly in national tax policies and in a lot of other things, but in every area where we can have an influence, uh, we are trying to help this process, and we are we are very happy to engage. You made the point of hybrid equity instruments. Uh, here in Germany, I'm sure you're fully aware of it. We have a history of having Vorzugsaktien. Uh, and the Genusschein, there was a, a yeah, yeah. So we'll have history. Whereas the Genusschein is 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 less controversial. Um, the uh, the Vorzugsaktien actually was, and and there was a put. There, there, there were shares without voting rights. Pretty much what you what you flagged, and to keep for, for keep for families to be able to keep control. And we know it's a very uh, oftenly used instrument, particularly when it comes to tech entrepreneurs, when they start to use uh, the public market, they they'd like to keep control. And um, but there's there's quite a controversial discussion about that whether they should be really a two tier um, uh, ownership structure. And um, um, so so do you think this should be the way it should be structured should be a, a temporarily thing or would you would you say the market Today needs that as 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 a, as a clear second option. It's not temporarily; it's a continuous thing. I I I would say um, I would say that it is very good that there is a debate about this in 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 every um, country uh, in Europe, and possibly there could be a debate at, at the European level, because because it, it it really opens up a discussion on how best address this uh, the, the, the shortfall and I would say it's it is it is a temporary or let's say it's a it's a it's a short and medium term problem now post the uh, pandemic but this can be this can be a long term um, a long term issue as well and and let me let me give you let me give you an example from another sector which which happens to be the banking sector where the 81 instruments the additional tier one instruments were introduced Post crisis, post the the last uh, the great financial crisis in uh, in two thousand eight and, and and ten, in order and this was a new instrument which was allowed in the in the regulatory framework uh, to bring in a new type of investor class into recapitalizing banks, and the, this the the eighty one instrument is a hybrid instrument. It was designed uh, to to provide long term capital uh, sources. Um, which which was sitting um, below um, or, or above equity in terms of seniority, but below uh, below that instruments, and it's a, it's a, it's clearly a hybrid instrument, and it played a very important role in allowing banks to strengthen their capital base. Um, it, it, in the meantime, uh, provided um, uh, hybrid rights um, in 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 the sense of of of, of debt and, and 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 equity, and it is functioning relatively well. And and the banks, uh, because there are features of these instruments that allow the banks to uh, buy them back, uh, they don't they don't need to become uh, completely permanent and 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 stay there forever. And and I'm not I'm just using this as an example that in a, in an in another sector where capital was needed. Um, uh, there was a solution found in in a very complicated regulatory framework, where hybrid instruments could play a role in 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 recapitalizing uh, the, the, that sector. Now, I think uh, the corporate sector must be a bit easier because it's of course there is much less regulation about uh, about about corporate capital, but the concept of a of a hybrid instrument, uh, even on a permanent basis, but with with possible options to um, to allow the repurchase or the the, the uh, conversion of, of these instruments could be an interesting avenue to explore. It's not a silver bullet, um, uh, and and of course there are controversies, uh, but th th that's why the debate is important to be had because that that can uh, that can add to the design features uh, of this. What we what we see is uh, a few very important factors. Uh, which needs to be decided first. Then, it, it, to, to, for these hybrid instruments to function, one is 
clearly the uh, the tax treatment of these instruments. There needs to be clarity of how the tax treatment is is um, is uh, seen by the by the authorities. The other one is the accounting treatment, and um, and the, um, the, uh, the the third one is clarity on the on the features of the of, of, of the of the hybrid instruments that could be standardized in order to uh, to to spread this uh, more more widely in in the legislation because of course contractually anyone can design any any instrument that fits the um, uh, fits the uh, the corporate law but with some standardization with a, with with a, with a uniform tax and accounting treatment uh, these instruments can be uh, can be uh, very positive in my view. Yeah. Do we need pension reform to make that work? Um, uh, I want to share a little bit of my pain over the last weekend. I was looking through my uh, my my various pension pension schemes, and I've seen over the last 10, 12 years basically they reflect sec second uh, actually no performance whatsoever. Um, so basically, um, I have to scale down my expectation. What eventually, after one of the biggest bull run in the, the in the stock market, one of the biggest uh, real estate bull market we have seen in the bond pool markets uh, over the last decade, and yet uh, in the pensions, uh, it does not even not show it. It even scaled down. Uh, heavy heavy risk restricted in Europe our pension schemes too much in getting exposure to equities and and, and, and other instruments I would so again I think that the uh, that the pension system is clearly an area at the national as well as at European level that needs to be looked at because p pension schemes um, are the, the are one of the bedrocks of the of, of, of equities markets and capital markets in general. Uh, pension investments are long term by by by, by definition by by nature. Um, they can be diversified. Uh, they, 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 it's very important that they are transparent, tax efficient, and cost effective. Um, one of the uh, what, 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 and, and and there is transparency and there is mobility of of of, of pensions. And I think very few pension systems uh, would fit. Uh, all, all, all these criteria uh, today in Europe, but clearly funded pensions, uh, so defined contribution uh, pensions, um, should in, in every country where they do exist and they do exist in large scale, uh, these these funds are major investors in equity uh, in, in equity markets, and they are providing um, um, a, a very good return compared to uh, compared to. Um, um, fixed income instruments. So, in a in a in a well diversified portfolio, there is clearly a role uh, for pension funds to invest in in, in equities uh, much more than uh, than, than today. Mm -hmm. Now, now comes a, a a very tricky question that makes it uh, uh, makes it now uh, goes towards the fiscal side of it. Do you does AFME have a have an opinion on when should be the time when uh, when the state should withdraw from supporting companies directly. We um, we do not we do not have a view on 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 sort of the timing or the speed of this with of, of 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 this withdrawal. What we what we see is that this will inevitably happen. Um, uh, for two reasons. One is sort of like demand and supply. One is that as the economy gradually returns to normal, the need for these fiscal fiscal support measures will reduce and, and, and companies will um, will be able to uh, step out of of, of, um, of, of, of of these support measures. And the second is the supply side that governments will not be able to afford uh, this 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 uh, this wholesale very uh, robust support uh, on, 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 on on in the long run. Uh, so th th they, they will be forced to withdraw, and it's already it's already happening. What we are saying here, and this is this is the that was the reason why we we we, we published the report, which we did in, in in January. What we what we what we are arguing and what we are emphasizing a lot is that while this support is being withdrawn, uh, there will be a funding need uh, which need to be plugged in the private sector. And that's where equity financing comes uh, comes to the fore because uh, because the the leverage which has built up in the in the balance sheet of the non-financial sector throughout the the pandemic with public support 
will probably not be sustainable in the long run and will constrain the investment, the new investment of these firms, because these firms will be uh, preoccupied with paying down the debt um, instead of investing into, into new projects and to their growth. So th- what we are arguing is that as this support is being withdrawn, equity funding needs to step in and, and, and plug the gap and, 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 and fill the gap. The exact timing um, and, and also even the scale to, uh, to estimate is very difficult to estimate. But what we see is that there is a large scale need and therefore this, this, is, a, this, this is of paramount importance. I could also mention that, that uh, exactly in the same, uh, in, in, in the same um, spirit, uh, for example, um, there is a complete review of the, of, of, of the listing uh, regime in the, U, in the UK, which has got a relatively um, uh, more developed uh, capital market, but still the authorities uh, have conducted a listing review exactly for, for, for this reason uh, to allow equity financing to be, uh, to be, to be scaled, um, to be, um, uh, scaled up, and they also looked at um, uh, dual class shares and and hybrid instruments. How these could could help uh, this process. So this is this is happening, and we are we are really promoting this across uh, across Europe. Yeah, Edmund, uh, a little bit more of a of a of a tricky question is um, you you rightly said that the EU is very much in mind with all the capital markets unions, the retail investors. At the other side, you also pointed out that pensions uh, pensions are the big and the most important uh, uh, pool of, 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 of funds for equity markets. Is eventually the EU too focused on the retail investor and it, its protection, does it not think enough about to be attractive and create even bigger capital pools for equity investments? Do they have the priorities right? I think, um, and I, 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 I referenced this in in um, in, um, in 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 my remarks. I think both are important. I think it's it's very clear that. And we, we, we talked about the cultural aspect. I think it's very important that the EU manages to increase retail participation, direct retail participation in, in, in capital markets, because it will just simply, it will help uh, for more people to have the experience uh, of, of investing into equity. But, but of course, we all know that retail investors, when they directly participate, they need to be protected. Equity markets are... Uh, representing higher risk and higher expected returns than, than fixed income markets and certainly higher risk than, than, than expected returns than plain uh, deposits. And, and, and therefore, uh, equity market investors need to have uh, strong protect- protection. We are, we are um, very supportive of this. There needs to be transparency. There needs to be uh, cost efficiency for, for them. And there, should, there needs to be um, strong protective measures uh, in terms of informing these investors and 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 and, and having um, uh, proper advice. Now the other, so th- this is, I think, this is very important in itself. We all know, on the other hand, that we cannot expect um, our all of our citizens to be their own portfolio managers and 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 and, and create um, a diversified por- portfolio themselves, and 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 and. And have a proper investment strategy for their for their pension savings and their future. We, we, that that's just not 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 realistic to to expect. And therefore, we need instruments uh, and 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 mechanisms. And pension is is a key uh, element of that, in which retail our retail investors, our citizens, can invest indirectly into equity. So we should we should build that up. But we should clearly when when we create that professional class of investors. The, protect, the investor protection rules should be different, um, should be proportionate, because because when when the investment is in professional hands, uh, the, the 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 requirements to protect um, the the end investor are completely different. Um, the the um, the, uh, the best execution reports can be 
uh, different. Uh, the information which the professional investors receive uh, can be different. On the other hand, invest and investors need to be protected against uh, excessive costs. Uh, there needs to be uh, transparency on the charges, but also there needs to be incentives for these institutional investors to actually invest in, um, in, in, in equity. So I would say it's, it's, I don't want to avoid the question of which should be the priority. I think both of them, uh, both of these directions or both of these measures should be high priority, but the measures that are implemented um, uh, to improve the current situation uh, should be different in the case of direct retail participation versus institutional. Yeah. My dear colleague, Dr. Breschel is joining the discussion. Welcome. Yes. Yes, <laughs> Adam, one question. And um, you mentioned that there, for the recovery of, of many of the companies within the EU, um, th there is a need for equity. On the other hand, the EU is currently really pressing hard uh, for ESG investments. Is, are all these companies who are currently suffering they will probably not be prepared to fit all the criteria for ESG investments. How is, how is that seen by AFMI? Is, is there really a 100% focus on ESG necessary in, at a moment when many companies are just uh, uh, fighting for, for survival? Is, is that the right, the right moment to, to implement these, these measures? I, I think in that, in, the, in that respect, um, clearly, the, the, the key question, what I would call, is transition, is how to, uh, the, the entire um, ESG agenda is, um, I, I mean, we know that there are, there are several debates in, in, in this. Um, it is clear that there is an urgency because of the climate, uh, of the climate risk, so we need to start the transition. Uh, the question here is how at what pace this transition takes place, um, and and you, your your reference is if if a, if a company um, is um, if, if a company is is is, is fighting for survival, um, how important it is to um, to um, to consider uh, ESG factors in its uh, in in its investment. I think there should be incentives uh, put in uh, for companies to shift um, out of non-sustainable activities and, and start to move uh, towards sustainable uh, activities. And this should be part of the survival um, strategy, I think. It, uh, there, should be a gradual, uh, there should be a gradual process um, in, in this. Um, the speed may vary, uh, of course, and views might be different on this. But I think that the, the, in, the, in this recapitalization and this, this sort of uh, new wave of investments, uh, the incentives should be uh, in the right place. The market mechanisms or pricing mechanisms of uh, ESG risk or, 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 um, or, or carbon footprint should be in the right place so that, so that companies put the ESG factors into, in, into, the, into the matrix, into the decision matrix, and, and they start the transition. Uh, a key, um, we all know that, that, that key um, points in this is first of all, an agreement on taxonomies. Um, we argue that it's important that we are, when we talk about taxonomies, we are not only talking about the, the, the binary state of what is bad and what is good, what is, what is green and what is, uh, what is brown, but we are also helping uh, in developing taxonomies that, that actually address the transition issue, exactly the issue you are, you are talking about, how to help companies uh, to move from one end of the scale towards the other end of the scale. And that's, we, we very strongly say that the, the transition of taxonomy is also needed for the definitions. Then the next one is once we have these definitions, once we have these taxonomies, how do we um, um, report on these? And, and there are EU initiatives in the, in, in the sustainable agenda, which I think is are also, they are trying to address the issue of proportionality of which, which, which companies um, are under these reporting requirements and how quickly this is introduced. This is exactly in, 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 in the same spirit of helping the companies to get out of the pandemic and, and focus the uh, reporting requirements on the ones that are, uh, that are um, big enough and, and significant enough to be able to report. And then the financial sector comes in 
and, and the financial sector uh, will also have to do its own assessment of its, uh, of its client base and its funding mix uh, as to how much it is in line with the, uh, with the ESG objectives. And the financial sector will also be forced to report, disclose and assess the, uh, the, the risk. This will be a gradual process. Uh, we think, uh, we, we say that uh, we should not give up the, um, the ESG um, targets and the agenda just because we are out of the pandemic, but we have to very carefully manage the transition in a, in a good sequencing uh, and, and proportionality. And can it, be, can it be a good chance for, for European capital markets to also attract international capital from the US or Asia? Because we are probably a, a bit ahead of, of the curve here. Absolutely. Uh, my answer to that is, is an absolute um, yes. Uh, first of all, I mean, judging from our membership, which is really a, a sort of global international member membership uh, active in the European market, there is great interest in um, playing a part in intermediating this, this fund and bring this funding into, uh, into the European economy. I think it's well recognized that Europe is... Um, Is, um, is, is moving very fast in, in, in actually creating the, the regulatory framework for, uh, for the green transition. So that's very much appreciated. And also there is a lot of investable capital that is, that is looking for sound um, um, sustainable investment opportunities that, are, um, that, 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 are, um, that can be verified um, and assured that it is indeed, uh, it is indeed uh, in line with the, uh, with, the, uh, with, with, with the agenda and with the objectives and not just, uh, let's say, um, instruments of, as, 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 it is, as it is called, greenwashing, um, uh, but, but, but real. And I think in, in, in Europe, uh, governments are taking this very seriously. Large corporates are taking it very seriously. Financial institutions are very strongly engaged uh, in this agenda. So it, it, I think Europe will attract a lot of these funds um, um, that are looking for these types of investments. Thank you. Yeah. And, and you, you, you mentioned that the taxonomy should show the transformation. Is, is there, uh, do you have a good example? Uh, do you have a, um, a reference where you say that that sort of taxonomy would be able to really show the transformation well? Yes. Yeah, so, 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 for, for example, um, let's take let's take an example where a company is, let's say, is 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 today doing some activities that are not 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 not, not qualified as green, um, as according to the taxonomy. Now, if if we take a very binary approach, then this company um, should not receive further funding that can be there can be um, a, a, an incentive if we are not careful there can be an in, incentive to disinvest from uh, from from this company whereas coal, this coal, coal is, a, is a clear example is a case or or yeah energy or, or some of the industrial um, in, in, in industrial activities um, we all we all know the uh, the, the, the key sectors in, in, in this uh, anything related to fossil fuel while these companies um, of course, certain certain assets of, of, of these businesses will need to be sort of abandoned or closed. But there are there are lots of assets where massive investments are needed in order to actually reduce uh, emission uh, significantly. So to move these industries out of the let's say the brown zone and and shift them into into green. But, but, but how can taxonomy? But how can taxonomy grab that? Well, taxonomy can have in trying to uh, define or set up, um, set up KPIs or technical definitions on what, what sort of uh, transitionary activities, for example, reduction, what sort of reduction of emission or, in, uh, or improvement of, um, of efficiencies, improvement of environmental impact can be considered as, as, as a transitionary investment and therefore can be supported positively by financing, uh, uh, by, by financing financing it. I mean, if we, if we look at the taxonomy um, today, there, there, it, there is a lot of science going into, in, in, into the taxonomies and there is a lot of science trying to determine what, what will be considered. And that there are technical measures that are defined, what will be considered um, uh, sustainable and green. We could, we could try to do the same science to, uh, to um, establish certain paths uh, mm -hmm. to, to achieve that. And, and that, that, that transition could then be 
seen in a positive light and 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 be funded in order to can, actually can, achieve the, the target can kind of go from oil to gas before yeah, exactly or, or, yeah. 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 Or, or 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 deploy new technologies that significantly reduce emissions in in, in a particular industry um yeah yeah thank you as we draw to a close, Adam, I'll have a, have a very tricky last, last one for you. As somebody who for 28 years has been trying to drum for equity investments in Germany, as, a, as an author of a study called uh, Stock Beats Bonds for Pensions, um, we had recently a, um, a questions answered to our Minister of Finance and our Minister of Economic Affairs. And what do they do with their money? Um, none of them has mentioned stocks. Um, so uh, we'll have um, what what can we do to really wholesale and fundamentally uh, in Europe and I think particularly Germany, but in Europe to get a wholesale reappraisal of stock in investments for private as well as, as, as pension money in that. Um, and do you, given your broad experience, given your broad membership, can draw on, on, on any reference where you say that's been successful? I think, um, I, I think that, that there needs to be a lot of, uh, lot of, lot of education. I, I think the basic, um, the, I think the, the basic mission should be to, to somehow better explain portfolio theory. Um, and and I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the old textbooks of Markowitz and, and, and the, 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 the portfolio theory textbooks, which would show uh, the long-term, and this is a very important that this is, these, we are talking about long-term investments, that the long-term differences of the risk and return characteristics of various types of investments. So, um, we can we can we can look at somebody going into short-term money market instruments and and just rolling it over for the long run. We can we can compare it to uh, government bonds, a portfolio of government bonds. We can co compare it to um, um, bonds with some credit risk uh, above the risk-free rate, and then we can we can go to equity markets. And I think there is clearly there is very compelling statistics to show that there is uh, mm -hmm. there, there there is a clear relationship between taking some more risk and and the long term expected returns i think if the, if this if this goes through um uh to uh to to the, to to the broader public then there will be an understanding and 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 a, 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 a sort of increasing appetite to put some of these investments into these long term investments into into equity a good example i think I, I would use an, a U.S. example is the um, is, is, is the U.S. 401k the the the, the U.S. Um, pension investments. There is a there's a clear scheme uh, which has got which 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 is branded in the society. Everybody knows it. Um, there is a there is a clear tax treatment um, which is which is well understood by the society. It is it is U.S. wide, so it, it can be it can be set up anywhere and can be invested uh, anywhere. And people do ha they are they got used to it. It's it's a household name, um, and I would not mention uh, other brands, but it's a branded product in in, in in there. And people are actually actively watching how they are how their um, investment in that in in that fund is is doing. There is no such a thing in Europe. I, 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 we, we don't we don't even have this branding. Uh, should we there, should should we have a European four one k plan? I think yes, and there is one. I mean, we all remember there is one attempt which recently has been made under the leadership of AOPA, uh, but it hasn't it hasn't taken off uh, the same way because it. It is not. It is not yet there. It's. It's. There. There are. There are still design flaws of, of 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 that pension product. But clearly, there needs to be a branded product which everybody understands. It's simple, transparent, um, and involves um, equity investments in the in the portfolios. Yeah, and if um, I may, if I'm, and if I may add, I would make it for each minister mandatory. 
Yes, yes, yes. It would, it's, be very, uh, it would be very educational. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I, I think it's um, it's very important that that uh, policymakers walk walk the talk, and 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 so the the uh, if 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 something is well designed and and it it is branded and it is um, it is introduced to the general public, then the policymakers who 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 actually design them and and put them in place are also believing in them. Um, I, I I think that's that's important. Yeah. We get we get applause about that here from from the audience <laughs> for the four one k plan. So thank thank you very much. It's not a question; it's a comment here. And uh, Adam, uh, besides Peter Brandt, you're the only one who joined us twice in food for thought. It was lots of food uh, for good sorts, and it, it a great end. We'll take it from there. Let's bear in mind the European four one k plan should be something we should all be striving for. Thank you very much. All the best. Tomorrow the video will be live, and we'll Thank share you. also the the publications which you, you you mentioned a few studies and few references. We'll make those references on the website to each and everybody. Dear audience, thanks very much for joining us. It's um, it's been excellent. We'll have a next food for thought on June sixteenth at eight thirty a.m. with Ching Mac. Cafferty. He, he will speak to us out of Hong Kong with a very interesting topic. He will look at the Japanese capital market and how the Japanese capital market has been integrated, integrating ESG criteria and how the stakeholder uh, uh, approach in, uh, in Asia and particularly in Japan should, could be something worth looking at and learning when we look about the future of, um, of stakeholder uh, capitalism in Europe. So an interesting topic. Thanks very much for all of you for joining. Adam, all the Thank best. You. And dear colleague, Dr. Breschel, hope to see you soon again. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Hubertus. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day.